Well, hi again. Uh, so we passed now the cornea, the refraction, the accommodation, and we are reaching the film. Uh, just like in your camera, you have the zoom lens, you have the iris, and then you have the film, the sensitive film. Our sensitive film is our retina, which is modified part of your central nervous system. And we will see that it's composed of several layers. I'll show you in the next picture. There is an outermost layer that has the rods and the cones, and the innermost layer will have what we call the ganglion cells, which means the light has to pass through several layers in order for you to get to your receptors, to the rods and the cones. We'll see that in a little bit. So if we look here at our layers of uh, the retina will realize that the light is coming into this direction and first it hits what we call the ganglion layer and the ganglion cells here which axons as you can see here will form the optic nerve we're good so some of about five percent or less maybe two percent or one percent of the ganglion cells uh, they also have additional function, which is very critical. They can respond to light. So they have a different pigment, which is very close to the rhodopsin that we see here. And that pigment will inform your brain, if you remember the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the reticular activation system, will inform your brain that it's light time. So the ganglion cells, they play a role in the regulation of your circadian rhythm as well. So just keep that in mind. They're not just cute cells passing the information forward. Some of them actually play a role and they sense the light and they can inform your uh, circadian rhythm centers in your brain about daytime. We're good? So the light again is hitting this way and then it's gonna pass through synapse, as you can see here. And the blue cells here are called bipolar because they have two poles, one pole here and the other pole here. So they're bipolar cells. And then we have the next synapse. So we have an outer synapse and we have an inner synapse. This is the outer synapse, this is the inner synapse. And then you reach to these cells, which will be your photoreceptor cells. As you can see here from this picture, uh, we have cells that look like cones and we have other cells that look like rods. So these guys, we call them the rods and the other ones we call cones. And in this depiction, just to make things easier for you, they try to show that these are the ones that will respond to the green. These are the ones that respond to the red. These are the ones that respond to the blue. And oh, by the way, the rods uh, respond to black and white images. They don't really see colors. Uh, they, I mean, they see the colors, but they translate the colors as black and white. Uh, so they don't produce to you color images. So for example, when you're at night, these rods will be the ones that are functioning. And when you are in a dim light, and that's why the dim light picture that you see on a moonlight or a distant street light, you cannot recognize lights, uh, the different colors uh, at all. Uh, you just see everything as black and white. And by the way, just for your information, the rods, which are these guys, don't really see the red color. So red color is black. And try that sometimes when you're walking under moonlight, look for a red car and you will see that it's a black color and which is important and especially if you're in the military and you're reviewing maps uh, then you would like to use the rods and you would like to use the cones to read the maps but without spoiling what we will learn later on which is the dark adaptation uh, of the rods that the rods are increasing the sensitivity but if you turn on the red light that's why in the developing room you may have noticed and in the movies when they are viewing in the submarine uh, the maps and stuff or in the tanks they have red light and the reason for it is that the cones will see the red light and the rods will think it's still dark so they're not going to lose the dark sensitivity that they have developed we're going to talk about that later on 
but just uh, but just for your So, um, let's see here how we get back to our image. Um, I had a phone call. Okay. So, um, as I said earlier, uh, we have uh, the light passing from uh, the inside of the eye, which would be here. So, the light is passing this way, and it will hit first the ganglion cells, and then it will hit the bipolar cells. And finally, it will reach the receptor layer. And the receptor layer, as we agreed earlier, will have the rods and will have the cones. We're good? Okay. So, and then in the end, we will have some pigmented layer. And that pigmented layer is very important because it will absorb the light and prevents the light from bouncing back and creating a blur inside your eye so it's important for us to have a pigmented layer which is part of the retina in addition also the choroid layer it has pigmented uh, has pigments in it and also has the blood vessels which will absorb the remaining light and so like the old cameras if you open them you will see that the inside of the camera is black and not to reflect and bounce the light around Sounds good? So that identifies to us our ganglion cells. We agreed that the ganglion cells, the axons from the ganglion cells, are the ones that are made the optic nerve. It identifies to us the bipolar cells, and then it identifies to us the receptor layer. What we did not mention is the horizontal cells. As you can see, the horizontal cells are forming these kind of synapses between the, they are involved in those synapses here. And we also have what we call amacrine cells. Now, the horizontal cells are very important as uh, in integration of the signal between the different receptors. And together with the amacrine cells, they are very important in performing, if you remember from the afferent signaling, something we call the lateral inhibition. And the lateral inhibition will make the visual acuity very strong that your uh, your brain is receiving a signal more from this cone but the ones next door to it are inhibited uh, and makes the image more clear because you know for sure point by point where is the image coming from so the amacrine and the horizontal cells will be very important in inhi inhibiting uh, this kind of blur by performing the lateral inhibition as well as integrating the signal from the different receptors and from the different bipolar cells in order for you to have a more comprehensive image. Sounds good? Okay, so let's go back again to the layers. Axons of the ganglion cells will form the optic nerve. Please do remember that. And you will realize that the optic nerve in this case is actually part of the central nervous system. So the optic nerve is not something that can regenerate if it gets damaged. For example, optic nerve atrophy or damages to the optic nerve is not something that can be regenerated and results in permanent blindness. And uh, the bipolar cell, so the path of the light is going in this direction. However, the depolarization wave is actually going in the opposite direction. And matter of fact, it's not always depolarization wave. You will see that the visual processing is more complicated, far more complicated than saying just depolarization. Matter of fact, it involves hyperpolarization. And so you will see it's going from, the signal is going from the receptors and then it will synapse here then going to the ganglion the, the bipolar cells and from the bipolar cells will go to the ganglion cells and then it's carried into the brain and we will see how the optic tract goes and first it's as optic nerve then optic chiasma then optic tract and then we will have the radiation the optic radiation inside the occipital lobe so we'll talk about that when we get to it but I just want you to appreciate the direction of the light 
and the direction of the signal going to the brain is into the opposite direction. Okay, so here's another picture just for your entertainment and your information here. Again, the direction of the light is going this way. It's going to pass all through these uh, layers in order to reach the uh, layer of the photoreceptors. The remainder of the light will be absorbed by the pigment epithelium, also by the choroid, so it doesn't reflect back and blur your vision. And uh, then when these guys fire their signal, and we will see how, then that signal will travel through the bipolar to the ganglion cells and to the optic nerve. And you will see the function in a little bit of the amacrine cells and the horizontal, which we pretty much said already that they are involved in the integration of the signal and also the lateral inhibition of um, the signal. So provides you with better visual acuity. Okay. Is all your inside of the eye covered with retina? No, uh, the retina covers about maybe five sixths of your inside of the eye. The anterior part of the uh, your eyeball is not going to be covered from the inside with retina. It ends at some point, and we call that ending because it's serrated area. We call it aura serrata. And inside the eye, where the optic nerve is actually emerging out, remember all the ganglion cells are sending the axons this way, and all those axons are merging together to form the optic nerve. Well, the area that is covering, that is here over the optic nerve, doesn't have any retina because it's just a collection of axons that formed uh, the optic nerve and the optic, uh, the optic disc, rather. And uh, so that's what we call the blind spot. Okay. On the other hand, this will be medially, a little bit lateral to that, we will have a very sensitive area called macula lutea. The macula lutea is extra sensitive because it doesn't have uh, much of what we call convergence. If you remember, thousands of nerves giving to you one nerve so you don't know where the signal is coming from. In addition, it will have plenty of cones which are much more sensitive, especially in the light, than the rods. And, um, and they give you the color vision and all that. And so, th and they have a lot of lateral inhibition. So the macula lutea becomes the best part, the favorite spot for your vision. That's why we direct our eye to the point where we are, when we want to read, right? Or we want to have best vision because we would like the image to fall on the macula lutea. Inside the macula lutea, we will have a little bit of a dip, a depression here. We call that the fovea centralis. You will realize also that there isn't that much blood vessels in that area, and which is good because you wouldn't like to have blood vessels crossing your visual field. That will impair your vision. At the fovea centralis, do you remember how the light has to go through so many layers in order for it to reach to the receptor layers? In the fovea centralis, which is the center of the macula, all these layers are diverted to one side, they're flipped to one side, and therefore you have easier access for the light. The light is not going to be distorted by all the cells lined up in its way. So that makes the fovea centralis extremely important for vision. It makes the macula lutea the most sensitive and the most accurate part. So obviously people with macular degeneration, and you have heard that term, especially if someone is diabetic, uh, they can lose 99% of their vision and they become blind, legally blind, even though the rest of the retina is fine. Remember that the macula lutea is the place you can read with. The rest provides you the surrounding, what we call the visual field, but the visual acuity is provided to you by the macula lutea. Medial to it, you're going to have the blind spot, so if the image falls on this, uh, you're not going to see anything. It's a little bit of an exercise in your book. If you focus, if you close one eye and focus your vision on one of those, uh, then on the plus, then you will realize that the other one is disappearing. Um, and so that will inform you better about what the blind spot is. And it's not necessarily the blind spot you have in the car. That's a whole different story. This is a blind spot when the image falls on the optic disc. 
the optic disc which we have here can give you a lot of indication for problems inside the brain like increased intracranial pressure hypertension will affect those blood vessels that are radiating the, uh, the, the central retinal artery and vein if you have a blood clot in the cavernous sinus it's going to show here uh, if you have uh, glaucoma it's going to show here diabetic retinopathy you can uh, diagnose by looking at the eye um, uh, with fundus examination of the eye. So obviously the fundus examination of the eye and the optic disc and the fovea and the blood vessels is very, very important tool and it can give you a lot of information about the health of the individual. Okay, so we did talk about the fovea or the fovea centralis and I also shared with you about the macula and uh, if the macula is degenerated then uh, obviously that is the most accurate place of your vision and the person will lose um, most of his visual acuity and resulting in uh, the person becoming legally blind okay now the photoreceptors the photoreceptors we have two different kinds as i said earlier the rods which respond to most of the light waves but they don't see the red they they don't recognize red for them red is black and then the cones the cones on the other hand they we have different kinds with different pigment and each of those will respond to a certain wavelength so we have one that will respond to red another will respond to green another one will respond to blue the combination of those the stimulus the stimulation from those three will give you the different pattern and the different colors that you see when you're looking at objects. Now, on the other hand, the rods will always give you the black and white image. The rods are not very sensitive in bright light. They lose the sensitivity in the bright light because you are burning all the, the rhodopsin very quickly. Uh, but the cones will be your sensitive ones in, uh, during light, uh, in light uh, environment. Whereas in dim environment, um, like a moonlight or a very dim light, it's the rods that are sensitive and the cones, they don't have, uh, they don't have enough light to give you a receptor potential, which will result in later on an action potential. And we'll see how that, how that happens. So keep that in mind. Rods are more sensitive in the dark. The cones are more sensitive in daylight. And so if you go to a dark room, then it's the rods that are seeing. And so you expect to see a black and white image. But you also, if you remember, I told you that the macula lutea has mainly cones. And so that's why in the dark environment, when it's like half lit environment, you can see a piece of paper. You have no problem seeing a piece of paper, but you can't read the text on that piece of paper. Because if you remember, the macula uh, lutea has only cones and the cones don't see well in dark uh, you will be only seeing with the rods and wait a second the rods are not even in the macula lutea on the or the fovea centralis so you're not able to read in the dark or look at your watch for example unless it's a it's a glowing watch sounds good if we look at the structure of it, we will see here that we have an outer segment which detects the stimulus, we have an inner segment, and then we have a synaptic terminal. So here is the outer segment. That one has a dye, and it's called rhodopsin, which, is, uh, which has the opsin, which is the pigment, and the retinal, uh, which is a, a derivative of uh, vitamin A. And... Uh, the, the different kind of rhodopsins are present in the cones, whereas there is only a single dye that is present in, uh, in the rods. Now, you will see in a little bit how the signaling uh, works, but generally we have the retinal sitting inside the opsin here. And that is in case of darkness. It's sitting very snugly, tight here, and once the light hits, then the retinal, as you will see in a little bit, it changes formation from what we call cis retinal to a trans retinal, all trans retinal. And when it's in the transformation, then this guy, which is sitting in the membrane, 
will start activating a different kind of G protein sitting here. That G protein is called uh, transducin. The transducin will be activated. It's a G coupled uh, protein that will be activated and it will result in signaling cascade that we will talk about, which increases the degradation of cyclic GMP. What's interesting about the eye is that during rest, during darkness, these receptors are depolarizing. Depolarizing. So the default for them is that they are depolarizing. Why is that? Because we allow the sodium current to keep coming inside, causing constant depolarization. And the interesting thing is once the light hits, then the depolarization stops and you start to enter into hyperpolarization or at least repolarization. And so it's unusual way because we are used to receptors when they are stimulated, then the stimulation will cause depolarization. It's the opposite here. The stimulation will cause, will cause cessation of the depolarization. That's a very important difference here to keep your mind on. So these were the parts and just keep the structure in your head for now because the next slide will talk more about what happens during dark and during light. During dark, as I told you earlier, you have on the cell membrane of these receptors, you have sodium channels that keep allowing the sodium to come in, right? And as you allow the sodium to come in, it will cause what we call the dark current and so constantly these cells are depolarized. Sounds good? Now, in the presence of light, now you're binding to the rhodopsin and the rhodopsin will activate a G-coupled G coupled protein. It's called transducin. And the transducin is gonna activate phosphodiesterase, phosphodiesterase enzyme. And the phosphodiesterase enzyme will break cyclic GMP will break cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP was very important in keeping the sodium channels open. So once you break up the cyclic GMP, you shut down the sodium channels, causing stoppage of the depolarization inside the cell. Sounds good? Once again, what we have here is constant depolarization that is maintained by the sodium channels being all the time open. Now, when you hit the light, the light will activate the rhodopsin. The rhodopsin will activate transducin. The transducin will activate phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase will break cyclic GMP, and that will result in less cyclic GMP inside the photoreceptor cell. Without the cyclic GMP, this channel will close, causing cessation of the inward current of sodium. Sounds good? Of course, there will be, uh, you will be degrading the rhodopsin, and so the, the, the rods are not going to catch up very quickly when you are burning the rhodopsin suddenly. The, the cones, on the other hand, they catch up and you will be okay with the cones, but the, the, the rods, you need a lot of rhodopsin in order for you to see anything, and in the presence of light, you are burning all the rhodopsin, and you are generating a very high signal and that's why our eyes hurt a little bit uh, not from the signal per se but from the amount of rhodopsin that you suddenly burn when there is a bright light like you were in the movie theater and you stepped out uh, and uh, and because you essentially have removed most of the rhodopsins which is very important because otherwise you're not going to reduce the sensitivity of your eye and it will keep hurting later on to look at any bright light you would like to reduce the sensitivity and destroying the rhodopsin is a good way to do that okay so as i said earlier the rhodopsin will have the opsin part if you go back to this picture here this is the opsin and this is the retinal and you're in the darkness the retinal is in the cis retinal formation whereas at light it becomes the old trans retinal and that change in the formation will cause the activation of a g-coupled protein here and that g protein called transducin that will activate phosphodiesterase and the rest we already uh, said that you are 
you are uh, reducing the amount of cyclic GMP inside the cells by increasing the phosphodiesterase, uh, reducing the amount of cyclic GMP will close the sodium channels. Sounds good? So here it is again. If we look at the events that happen, this is during dark, this is the cis, this is the old trans. Uh, if you hit it with light, the cis will become the old trans. And then uh, because of the old transformation, that will change the shape of the rhodopsin. It will activate a G protein called transducin. The transducin will result in cyclic GMP degradation because you're activating, it's not here in this picture, but you need to know this, that the cyclic GMP degradation by the phosphodiesterase activity will result in the fact that the sodium channels will close. And if the sodium channels close, then there is no more depolarization. And that means the neurotransmitter that is being secreted here will get reduced. So wait a second. It's not like we are activating a receptor. So there will be a production of the glutamate, which is the neurotransmitter. No, to the opposite. The neurotransmitter is constantly released. And it's in the presence of the light that the neurotransmitter will fail to be exocytosed. So keep that in mind. It's not that we are depolarizing the membrane of the receptor, but we're actually stopping the depolarization from happening because the depolarization is all the time on when it's dark. Keep that in mind. That's a very, very important thing. Okay. So, but what really makes a difference is if we go back here, you see the bipolar cell, which doesn't show in this picture, but imagine a bipolar, another bipolar cell over here, right next to it. This one is receiving glutamate. This is also receiving glutamate. So imagine two of them side by side. Here's one, here's the other one. This one, if it receives the glutamate, it says, okay, there is no more light, okay? That means it's off. If it receives the glutamate, it tells the brain it's dark. And the other one, if it receives the glutamate, it tells the brain, oh, it's light. It's very important distinction. So now with the on position and the off position coming from the same photoreceptor, the brain will be able to distinguish what we call on off response. The on off is depending on the kind of receptors that we have on your bipolar cells. So if we have a look here, you will realize that every on bipolar cells will be surrounded functionally by off bipolar cells. So if I would stimulate during the light, if I would stimulate those, they will, during darkness, if I would stimulate those, they will go into on, whereas the on position will go into off. That's during the darkness. And during the light, it's the opposite. The off, during the darkness, the off will be on. I know it's confusing. The off will be on and the on will be off. Get it? So the one that tells your brain that there is a light coming in, in the darkness, it will be off because there is no light coming in. And the part of the bipolar cells that tell the brain that there is no light coming in, if there is light coming in, it will be off because it will be on, I'm sorry, because there is light coming in, see? So it depends on the bipolar cells, how they will translate the information that's coming from the glutamate that is being released or the cessation of the glutamate. Remember, we're actually preventing the glutamate from going to the bipolar cells with the light. Otherwise, we're having the glutamate being secreted all the time and the response of the glutamate, the response of the glutamate on the bipolar cells will depend on the kind of receptors for the glutamate that is present on the bipolar cells. Is this receptor going to cause depolarization or hyperpolarization? Hyperpolarization will tell the brain it's off. Depolarization will tell the brain it's on. Keep that in mind for the on-off response and keep in mind the fact that the photoreceptors, the default for them in the darkness is that they are depolarized and it's actually when they are stimulated by light, they stop being depolarized. 
So it's unusual situation where you have the glutamate, your neurotransmitter, being secreted in the darkness and stops being secreted, stops being exocytose towards the bipolar cells when there is a light. Keep that in mind. Okay. So obviously we have different kinds of cones. The different kind of cones will give you the combination of the light. Uh, the cones have more acuity because they're present around your macula lutea. They will give you the color vision and they are low sensitivity, but they're perfect for the light because in the bright light, you don't need high sensitivity. It is in the, in the dark light or in the dark environment, you want to use the ones with high sensitivity, which are these guys. But because these guys are highly sensitive, once you turn on the light, then you are using those guys by default because you're going to burn a lot of the rhodopsin here. And if you burn a lot of the rhodopsin, these, then these guys are not working as well anymore. They need all their rhodopsin. You can't just burn all of them and expect them to function in the bright light. We're good? Okay. So the dark adaptation involves two processes and the same thing with the light adaptation. There is an immediate adaptation that involves your iris. Remember the pupil dilating and the pupil constricting, that is immediate response. And there is a delayed response that is involving more of building up rhodopsin or burning down rhodopsin. If you are in the dark, now you're building more rhodopsin because you're not burning it up and therefore you're increasing the sensitivity of your rods. If you are in the light, you're burning a lot of rhodopsins, and therefore you're not going to see anything with the rods, which need a lot of rhodopsin, but on the other hand, the cones will be fine because they only need very uh, little sensitivity to function anyways. So that explains to you the dark adaptation and the light adaptation. And we briefly mentioned in the lecture, that's why when you walk into the movie theater, you don't see much, but then a little later, you start to see the surrounding inside the movie theater. This depicts you the different cones and how the different cones, the combination of them, give you the perfect color vision. In the absence of one of those dyes, then the person may not see a certain color or doesn't know the difference between green and red or the blue and red and sometimes it's the axis between them that is lost resulting in color blindness and there are many tests for color blindness for example this one here uh, to test if the person is able to read the number that is in the image okay how does the signal go to the brain later on so as we said the ganglion cells will form to you the axons of the ganglion cells form to you the optic nerve the optic nerve will cross half of it will cross to the other side and the other half is continuing this is called optic chiasma this part here is called optic tract and from the optic tract you get to the thalamus remember the thalamus is the gateway for a lot of things and specifically in an area of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate body and or the lateral geniculate nucleus and from there you get into the optic radiation to the occipital lobe and then the brain needs to figure out with your association fibers and the higher uh, uh, areas in the occipital lobe what does this signal mean okay so that was it for the vision and the physiology of the eye I hope you uh, will find it useful and to review the material and uh, I will see you in class or in the next video. Have a great day.